Janabalava Girivaradhari Jashoda Nandana Braja Janaranjana Shodha Nandana Braja Janaranjana Jamuna Tira Banachari Jamuna Tira Banachari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjavi Hari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjavi Hari Shishi Radha Madhava Ki Jai Shubhava Upad Ki Jai Tai Go Brahmanandi Hari Hari We're going to continue talking about the descent of Mahaprabhu and what that means. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Shami Tinamene Namaste Sharashati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nevise Sasunyavari Paschatya Dasatamine Bancha Kapa Turubhyas Chakapa Sindhubhyeva Chapa Titanam Pavane Vyo Bhaisna Vibhyo Namo Namaha Mukam Karoti Bachalam Pangolangai Tegarim Yakrokupa Tamaham Bande Guru Siguru Dinatarinam Sri Krishna Chaitana Pramanitananda Shadaita Gadadhar Sri Vashari Gaur Bhakta Brinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare Shila Prabhupada Ki Jai, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu Ki Jai, Gaur Bhaktivin Ki Jai. So I will bring up my screen. I have, and we will begin by reviewing the verse that we started this series with. And I'll read it again, and you can see it. You can all see it. Is that correct? I can't see you to see if you've nodded. So you can scream. Yes, we can see it. We can see it. Good. Anarpita Charim Chirat Karunaya Vatirna Kalo Samar Paitam Udnata Jvala Rasam Sabakti Shriyam Hari Purata Sundara Duti Kadamba Sandi Pataha Pitaha Sadari Daya Kandare Spuratova Sachinandanaha. Translation May the Supreme Lord, who is known as the son of Srimati Sachi Devi, be transcendentally situated in the innermost, innermost core of your heart, resplendent. With the radiance of molten gold, he has descended in the age of Kali by his causeless mercy to bestow what no incarnation has ever offered before the most elevated mellow of devotional service, the mellow of conjugal love. So one thing I wanted to emphasize in the beginning, which is very inspiring and comforting, I would say more comforting than inspiring, inspiring, but especially comforting, is that Bhakti comes by the mercy of Guru, um, and here we're seeing by the mercy of Mahaprabhu, and the Guru delivers the mercy of Mahaprabhu. And that bhakti, as we know, is given to everyone, and the qualification, as we said, was to be intelligent and fortunate, to take it. And so being sinful is not a disqualification. Being fallen is not a disqualification. It, it, those those are not being sinful cannot destroy bhakti and being pious cannot make bhakti happen bhakti comes by the mercy of a pure devotee and so our sins cannot stain bhakti bhakti is transcendental the mercy of the guru is transcendental so we can act even though we are very fallen and and we know in shastra 
And we hear in many places that ahaituki abhakti ahaituki apratyata that bhakti is causeless. And one of the meanings meanings of this causeless is that it can't be caused by anything material. And so because it, it cannot be caused by anything material, it cannot be destroyed by anything material. So sometimes, sometimes we think that my own mentality, my sinful mentality, my materialistic mentality can destroy bhakti. It can't destroy it unless you act on it. But just because you have it, it's not going to destroy bhakti. If you're sincerely engaged in bhakti, you can have all kinds of un, you can have all kinds of bad thoughts, bad desires, and so forth. That is not going to stain your bhakti if you don't act on them. So it's not a disqualification. Because if bhakti can't be created by something material, then neither can can it be destroyed by by anything material. So we have this concept in 11th Canto of Bhagavatam of a devotee who is praying that I'm sinful and fallen, materialistic, etc. And simultaneously, I have a desire for pure bhakti. And it seems to be a contradiction. And the fact is, we are all living contradictions of th this apparent contradiction. And that, that as conditioned souls, we have so many desires, which are not part of bhakti that we have desires in our heart, which is not the heart of bhakti. And amazingly, at the same time, we have the desire to be Krishna conscious. We have the desire to serve Guru and Goranga. And in one sense, one, could, one would think, if one is thinking more logically, that how could you have both? Either you have one or the other. But we are all examples of both. And how do we have both? By the mercy of Mahaprabhu, the desire to be Krishna conscious is coming to us through through the practice and through Shavanam Kirtanam, through here, especially hearing and chanting, that desire is coming. And that desire is growing, and it grows in spite of all the weeds around it. So, of course, if we commit offenses, then it, it is said that the water of hearing and chanting just will cause the weeds to grow and not the creeper of bhakti. So I'm not saying that you don't have to worry. But what I'm saying is what Mahaprabhu came to give works on any garden as long as one is faithful and respectful to the teachings and to other living entities and is willing to plant it. And it's such a powerful seed, it can grow in this like horrible soil. The, it, it, so it's growing in the, the soil of the conditioned soul's hearts, and it really shouldn't, because our hearts aren't our hearts aren't a good place for it to grow. It shouldn't really grow in it, but it does. And so that's important to understand, because you know we we always hear this line: "I'm I'm so fallen. I'm so fallen that." And then what comes after that is all the reasons that I find it difficult to be Krishna conscious. I'm so fallen that it's hard to chant. It's so fallen that it's hard to get up early. And so I'm so fallen that. But it's important to understand that none of that so fallen stuff has to have any effect on your desire to purely engage in devotional service and purely desire to serve Krishna. It will only have that effect if you psych yourself out and think, well, yeah, because I'm so fallen, therefore, I can't become Krishna conscious. But this verse and our whole discussion, as, as you probably realize now, is exactly the opposite of that thinking. There's nothing in any of the discussion of Mahaprabhu's descent that really supports that mentality unless you engage that mentality, unless you give in to that mentality. So in Kali Yuga, we're not held karmically responsible for what we're thinking, we're held karmically responsible for what we're doing. And Jiva Goswami says, sometimes we think offensively, but it's when we speak that offense, that's when the big reactions come. So obviously if we're thinking offensively, mentally, emotionally, we're affected, but not we're, our bhakti is not drastically affected until we engage in sinful activity and even 
And even Apichet Sudaracharo, where Krishna says that sometimes a devotee may accidentally fall down. And so even the manifestation of those sins sometimes comes. But if the devotee's desire is, I want to be Krishna conscious, that was just a bad habit. And I'm regretful. That doesn't block his bhakti. And Krishna considers him a sadhu, which means really Krishna is overlooking that. One devotee had written me and he said, I feel guilty. I, I feel guilty. I feel that Krishna is always looking at all the things I'm doing wrong. And I explained to him that that ordinary people, that's how they see, but elevated people see only the good in others. And so what to speak of Krishna? You know, you know, we're thinking Krishna's seeing all the bad, but actually we're seeing all the bad and he's seeing all the good. And then by us seeing all the bad, if we're not careful, we can become discouraged. I mean, we should see the bad because we need to know what to work on. But if we see it in the wrong way, we become discouraged. So Krishna doesn't become discouraged, Prabhupada doesn't become discouraged because they understand the power of bhakti and the power of, of the kripa shakti, karuna shakti, the mercy, that it acts in spite of any sinful thing we've done or any crazy thoughts that go through our head. What, what is important is the sincere desire. Now he kalyana krit kastyad durgatin tattagachati. One who does good is never overcome by evil. So the sincere desire is what pushes us and the sins, they're not really, they don't, sins do not stain the soul. Offenses stain the soul. Or we could say our own crazy mind that gives in to material desire, that, that is going to disrupt our bhakti. But the fact that we have the desires, that in and of itself is not a disqualification, it's normal, as long as you don't cultivate those desires. That's the problem. We cultivate them. Sometimes we, we become dis discouraged when well, those desires arise. But the thing is, if those desires are arising because of, because of past samskars, it means that we're not consciously cultivating them. You know, like you have a bad habit and sometimes out of habit, you do something and you think, oh, I don't want to do that. I don't like doing that. I'm trying not to do it. So people understand when you do it, yeah, it's not, it's not really your fault, it's not your intention. We, we know, let's say you have like a bad temper or something. So you get angry and say, we know you're not really angry at us. It's just, you have a bad temper and you, and you don't, and you always apologize when you get angry. So if that's the case, that it's just conditioning, condition response. But the main thing is that we want to serve Krishna. Then, it, then you don't have to worry And the process will purify. If you just, you know, like focus on the process, on the positive, that will purify. That's the idea. And these other things, they'll gradually go away. They'll gradually get purified. It's just that how it is. You know, I mean, everything and everything you do in Krishna consciousness is purifying. Seeing the deity, seeing Tulsi, taking Charnamrita, seeing the devotees. Well, to speak of hearing and chanting, this is all this is all just cleansing. And I think one of the reasons we sometimes get discouraged is because we don't realize how much dirt there is to cleanse. So we're thinking, but I've been cleansing all year or the last three years. I've been cleansing. Doesn't seem I'm getting to the bottom of the pot of the of the trash. That just seems like an endless black hole. Uh, Prabhupada once joked, he said, Yeah. He said, Purifying my disciples is like trying to clean coal. Yeah, and if you don't understand what that means, find some coal and try to clean it. Do it outside, because it's going to be a mess. The more you try to clean it, the more messy it gets. So, of course, that was Prabhupada's joking, right? That was his joke. But I'm sure you felt that, you have felt that way before. Um, but... Conditioning is deep rooted, but it's not all powerful. And the holy name is all powerful. Mahaprabhu's mercy is all powerful. So, so always this example is given Krishna Surya Sam. Krishna is like sun, Maya high on the car. Maya is like dark, darkness. Yaha Krishna Tahan Maya Adhikar. Where there's sun, there's no darkness. Where there's Krishna, there's no darkness. So I have so much darkness within me, but every day I'm exposing myself to light. So it's not a problem. 
even though the darkness will come, as soon as I expose myself to light, it's not a problem. The only problem is if I don't expose myself to light, then darkness will prevail. Or I'm chanting Hare Krishna and I'm not getting any light from it. I'm studying and I'm not studying deeply. I'm not getting light from it. So I may be externally doing my sadhana, but there's no light or very little light. So therefore these anarthas and these other problems will continue. But as long as we're doing it well, the light comes in. And using this example, hopefully, it's an impetus to, to have some bright lights shining in your heart, you know, which is chanting uh, without at least making every effort not to make offense and just begging Krishna for pure devotional service. That's, that's your success formula. You can't, you can't lose if you do that. But if we give in to the Anarthas, it's hard to do that. The desire, we lose the desire. It's, it's, you have to be careful. But anyway, I just wanted to make that point that, that bhakti doesn't, doesn't really worry so much about sin. Of course, we have four principles we're supposed to avoid those. We can't. We can't come to the stage of pure bhakti if we're still engaged in sinful activity. Obviously, that's a, the foundation has to be pure. But those past sins or those accidental fall downs, they don't, they're not really, it doesn't mean much. It's like sometimes you find a, a businessman goes bankrupt, and then three years later, he's a millionaire again, or multi-multi-millionaire. So it, didn't, it doesn't really stop him because he has the right mentality. So something like that. If you have the right mentality, no setback can stop you. It's just we're conditioned souls. Sometimes we do stupid things. Sometimes we misunderstand. Sometimes we give in. That's what it means to be conditioned soul. Welcome. Welcome to, we didn't even know we were conditioned souls before we were devotees, right? We thought we were normal. When you become a devotee and you realize um, I wasn't normal. That the normal state is Krishna consciousness. And, and the problem is the normal state feels unnatural because we've been away from it for so long. And the abnormal state feels natural. But as you progress, it will change. So we're going to skip now to verse 4. Uh, excuse me, verse 14. I'm assuming you're seeing that. And we're going to begin. I think this is where we left off. I'll read uh, the verse we left off. I think we read 13. So we'll read this verse again. Lord Krishna enjoys his transcendental pastimes as long as he wishes. And then disappears. After disappearing, however, he thinks thus. For a long time, I have not bestowed unalloyed loving service to me upon the inhabitants of the world. Without such loving attachment, the existence of the material world is useless. So we read this purport. We'll read again. The Lord seldom awards pure transcendental love, but without such pure love of God, freed from fruitive activities and empiric speculation. One cannot attain perfection in life. So this is a definition of love. Love means the other person, everything for the other person. All for Krishna, nothing for me. And you might think that sounds kind of depressing. But that's what pure bhakti is. It's not depressing at all. Everything for me, nothing for God, that's actually depressing. We just, you know... <laughs> We have our heads on backwards, basically. Okay, so we read this verse also. Everywhere in the world, people worship me according to scriptural injunctions. But simply by following such regulative principles, one cannot attain the loving sentiments of the devotees in Rajabhumi. So uh, we discussed this a little bit, but we should clarify this. Does this mean we don't have to follow regulative principles? Is this the verse? that you've been looking for ever since you joined ISKCON. I don't have to follow regular principles. I knew it. Rules and regulations. It's just another religion. Is, is that what it means? No, it doesn't mean that. 
a devotee always follows rules and regulations, even when he doesn't have to, because if he doesn't, then other people will look at him and think, I don't have to either. So that's one reason. He, he doesn't have to follow them when he is more elevated, but he knows other people have to follow them. And he knows if he doesn't follow them, they will, you know, you know, always copy the worst things people do rather than the best things, isn't it? You know, somebody has like impeccable character and quality that nobody can copy it. And then he does something bad and that's what everybody copies. <laughs> Well, why, why can't I do that? He d does it, yeah. It's like, why, why can't I dance with the gopis? Okay, lift over downhill for seven days. You know. Why can't I imitate Lord Shiva? Drink an ocean of poison first. So what this verse is referring to is spontaneous devotional service. Of course, when you're liberated and you're in Braj, there you don't have sadhana because you don't need sadhana because you're already perfect. And sadhana, sadhana means practice. So why would you practice if you're already perfect? So they're, they're in lila. But what this verse is also referring to is practicing Krishna consciousness, not just in awe and reverence to the Lord. You are the father, I'm the son, I'm the daughter. I bow down to you. No, we, we do that. We follow rules. But as one progresses, internally the heart changes. And one is serving, being motivated by the desire to enter into a particular relationship with Krishna. Although they're doing the same thing. So what Krishna is saying here is, that you, you may have heard these verses where Krishna said, maybe you've heard this in the Dhamma Dharlila, where Krishna says, but Mother Yasoda chastises me. It's much more pleasing than when the Brahmins are chanting the Vedas. You are great, you are powerful, you are all pervasive. And Mother Yasoda says, Krishna, why did you do that? You naughty boy ties him up. That's that's called Raga Marga. That's 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 what Krishna likes. So that's what's being being referred to. And if you just follow the path of Vaidhi Bhakti, you end up in Vaikuntha. And Vaikuntha is still even in Vaikuntha, it's 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 guided by rules and regulations. So you know, if you come from a very bureaucratic country, maybe you want to go to Vaikuntha. If you live in California, maybe you want to go to Braj. You know, it's not like that, but it's. You know, you know, you know what it's like in a bureaucratic country. Uh, a lot of paperwork, a lot of rules and regulations. So, Gop Kumar, when he was on his way through the, the various planets, he was trying to find what his rasa is and where he should end up. And he he went through all so many planets. He ended up in Baikunta. And his relationship with the Lord is as a friend, Sakya. But Sakya doesn't exist in Baikunta. That's all reverence, or maybe reverential friendship at, at most. So he was dealing with Lord Vishnu as a friend, and that was kind of like slapping the queen on the back. You can't do that. You can't slap the queen on the back. It's not, you're not allowed to do that. So they were all stopping him. He was like, what's wrong? No, 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 you can't do that here. So, so that's what is being referred to. Krishna consciousness in um, that mode. Now, you might say, well, what about me? Well, in the beginning, we practice that way, and naturally, it will develop in other ways. Not artificially, but naturally, as you continue to hear about Krishna's pastimes with his devotees in Vrindavan, you will develop a desire to enter those pastimes as you worship Radha and Krishna, as you worship Mahaprabhu who came to, to glorify the residents of Braj, especially the gopis, then that desire will develop. So Mahaprabhu, as we know, Krishna, as we know, is, is most satisfied with intimate dealings. There's a story, I believe it was Gorka Shordas Babaji, some kids were making fun of him or playing some tricks on him. 
And what he said was, Krishna, I'm going to tell Mother Yasoda that you're doing this. You know, like, so that was, that was his relationship with Krishna, that he saw that these boys were sent by Krishna, Krishna is naughty, and he has that relationship. I'm, I'm going to tell Mother Yasoda you've been naughty. I'm going to complain. So we know about this. We've read Krishna book. We've read Bhagavatam, hopefully, 10th canto. So we understand these things. And so this is what Mahaprabhu is saying here. This is kind of bhakti I like. Whoops. That was the wrong one. There you go. So we'll begin reading. So now I'll begin with this Bengali because this is Maybe we read this also. Aishwarya Gyanete Shabha Jagat Mishrita. Aishwarya Stihila Prema Nahi Mora Prita. Prita. Knowing my opulences, the whole world looks upon me with awe and veneration. But devotion, made feeble by such reverence, does not attract me. So this is, you know, this can be a bit puzzling because we're learning Mahaprabhu's coming to give prema. And so what about all those cycles, Kali Yuga, you know, a thousand Kali Yugas, and he didn't give prema. And here he's saying, I don't even like it when my devotees worship me. Like, all you in Vaikuntha, yeah, you're okay. But it's in Braj, that's what I like. Yeah, of course, he's not going to say that in Vaikuntha, but basically that's what he's saying. And so naturally the mind thinks, how can he say that? Because for a thousand Kali Yugas, he was being worshipped in on reverence. He's being worshipped in on reverence in so many different sampradayas, sampradayas. But what, what is going on now by studying Mahaprabhu is we're studying what's going on deeply in his heart. He's he's like becoming vulnerable now. It's just He's becoming, um, as we say, an op- Mahaprabhu is becoming an open book. So now, by studying Mahaprabhu's appearance, we enter most deeply, not into the mind of Mahaprabhu, but really into the mind of Krishna, because Mahaprabhu is brought in Krishna together. So, But specifically, we're understanding Krishna's mind through Mahaprabhu, and this is... This is actually necessary to develop love because there was a song. The song was said something the, something like, the more I know you, the more I get to know you, the more I, I get to love you, or the more, I, the more I get to know you, the more I love you. So we, we want to develop love for Krishna and we need to hear about him. So we're not just hearing about what he's doing, but now we're hearing about what's deeply in his heart, what he's thinking. So we're all like now transcendental psychologists entering into the mind and heart of Mahaprabhu, what he's thinking. Isn't that interesting? And I'm sure you're thinking, this is like unbelievable because I'm not at all qualified to do this. Prabhupada has given us his books, and therefore he's saying, I want you to learn this. This is, this is what we do in Kali Yuga. We learn about Mahaprabhu. So, qualified or not, here we go. Fasten your seatbelts. We're going to take off. You got a free first class seat. Tomorrow I want to know what's that sun? Is that it? The more I want to know you, the more I want to show you. Lord. No, 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 no. This this song was uh, came out, Janaki, when you were way into your last, when you were not even way into your last birth. Something like to love, to know, know, know you is to love, love, love. Tanya will find that song. We'll feature it at the end of class. It's a really, it's not a very good song, but the words are good. It's like from the 50s or something. It's not really rock and roll or anything. 
She found it. Okay. There it is. Bobby Vinton, to know you is to love you. Hare Krishna. I'm going to check it out first before I let you hear it. What? As you may know. You're going to... My computer's my computer's too slow, so I won't I won't contaminate you with this. No, 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 you was too low. You can check it out if you want, but um, this is this is why we're we're allowed to learn so much because Mahaprabhu wants us to. So we are we are sitting on the beach, looking out at this vast ocean, and we're being explained what's in this ocean. And some of what you hear, you're just gonna hear it and you're gonna not understand it or not understand a lot. But the next time you hear it, you'll understand a little more. And you know, 10 years from now, 20, 50 years from now, when it's Mahaprabhu's appearance day and you're giving class or somebody's giving class and they, Recite this verse, Anarpitam charin chirat karana vatirne kalo. Samarpitam, samarpaitam unata ujvala rasam. So bhakti suyam. Oh yeah. 50 years ago I heard that verse, I had no idea. I had no idea. I thought I understood something. I don't know. And now, now I finally understand it. Yeah, so that's that's the process. Prabhupada told us that's the process. You just hear it, understand or not, just keep hearing. Hearing is purifying. So that's what we're going to do. Mahaprabhu wants us to hear. Somebody gives you a million dollars. You think, why did you give me a million dollars? I'm not qualified. No, I wanted to give it to you. Yeah, but there's so many other people. They need it more than I do. No, I want you to have it. Okay, he wants us to have it. So fasten your seatbelts, we're going to take off. Hare Krishna. So here's the purport. We read the verse again and the purport. Knowing my opulences, the whole world looks upon me with awe and veneration. But devotion made feeble by such reverence does not attract me. Purport. After his appearance, Lord Krishna thought that he had not distributed the transcendental personal dealings with his devotees in Dasya, Sakya, Vatsalya, and Madhurya, particularly in the mood of the residents of Braj, which is called spontaneous or Ragmarg, that he had not distributed. One may understand the science of the Supreme Personality of Godhead from the Vedic literatures, and thus become a devotee of the Lord and worship him within the regulative principles described in the scriptures. But one will not know in this way how Krishna is served by the residents of Brajabhumi. One cannot understand the dealings of the Lord in Vrindavan simply by executing the ritualistic regulative principles mentioned in the scriptures. By following scriptural injunctions, one may enhance his appreciation for the glories of the Lord, but there is no chance for one to enter into the personal dealings with him. Giving too much attention to understanding the exalted glories of the Lord reduces the chance of one's entering into personal loving affairs with the Lord. To teach the principles of such loving dealings, the Lord decided to, to appear as Lord Chaitanya. So you're reading this and probably thinking, but you know, I need to strictly follow the regular principles. That That's all I know. You know, how could I do anything more? And if that's how you feel, it's true. At the same time, Prabhupada concerned that perhaps he wouldn't live long enough to translate the entire Srimad Bhagavatam, decided to stop his translations and do a summary of the 10th canto. 
within that sum summary, he included Bhagavad Gita philosophy so we could understand the transcendental nature of those pastimes. But we can understand clearly that he wanted us to be hearing those pastimes and understanding the love of the residents of Raja and wanted us to at least understand that that's the goal. So you may start out thinking, yes, I must strictly follow all the principles. I must always strictly follow. I just, I must obey ritualistically. I must do all these things. But now that Mahaprabhu has come, you understand the goal is spontaneous devotion. The goal is worship of Radha and Krishna and Vrindavan. So that makes a huge difference because that's through your Vaidhi Bhakti, following rules and regulations, your goal is no longer to go to Vaikuntha and worship Lakshmi Narayan. And on reverence, your goal is something greater. Your goal is Vrindavan. Your goal is to develop one of those four relationships, servant, friend, parent, or lover in spontaneous devotion. And that's what Mahaprabhu came to give. And so because he came to give it, that's his gift. Just as when you get a gift, you use the gift. If you, you know, you come to my house and you say, oh, I gave you that gift uh, a year ago. You haven't even opened the box. It's kind of discouraging for you, isn't it? Whereas if you give me a sweater and every day you see, oh, he's wearing the sweater I gave him. That's inspiring, right? So this is the gift Mahaprabhu gave us. This is what he wants us to understand. So this is what we're trying to understand. And this is what we're doing in this class. We're trying to understand the heart and mind of Mahaprabhu, which, which, which also means to understand the heart and mind of Srimati Radharani. And by understanding the heart and mind of Srimati Radharani, we understand the heart and soul of Bhakti. Because there's no greater devotee than Radharani. She has the most bhakti. Okay, so now I believe the next verse we haven't read yet. This is where we start. Aishvarya jnane piri bhajana kuriya pai kuntat ke jaya chaturvida mukti pana pana by performing regulated devotional service in awe and veneration one may go to Vaikuntha and attain the four kinds of liberation. So the next verse describes the four kinds. Sharshti sarupya ara samipya shalokya sayujana laya bhakta yate brahma oikya These liberations are sharshti. Achieve, this is in Vaikuntha. Achieving opulence is equal to those of the Lord. Sarupya, having a form the same as the Lord. It's hard to, when you go to Vaikuntha, if you ever do, it's going to be hard for you to find Krishna because everyone looks like him. Except Krishna, there's a few signs. Lakshmi is on his chest, a few signs. Kostuba gem. Samipya, living as a personal associate of the Lord. And Salokya, living on a Vaikuntha planet. Devotees never accept Sayuja, however, since that is oneness with Brahman. So sometimes those who practice Vaidhi Bhakti are motivated, are motivated to become liberated, go back to Godhead. And so Prabhupada said, pure devotee is not motivated by that. That is not considered pure devotion. If there's any motivation other than what Krishna wants, it's not considered pure. So the, the um, residents of Braj, you know, you know the story, right? The um, Krishna has a headache story. So Narada Muni went, was told by Krishna, I have a headache, tell my devotees that I need the dust from their feet, put it on my head. And so he went around, nobody would give the dust of their feet. Why won't you give the dust? If I give the dust, I'll go to hell. So when he asked the gopis, immediately they gave the dust. And Narada Muni said, aren't you afraid you'll go to hell? It doesn't matter. Krishna has a headache. It has to be relieved. That's pure devotion. 
So that's that's a really nice story. Because pure devotion doesn't calculate what what's in it for me. So therefore, the desire to go back to Godhead, which means you can get a body like Krishna, you can have the opulence of Krishna. You live on the same planet, and you have the same powers. Those four qualities. Um, opulence, same form, become a personal associate, live on the planet. It's kind of the same thing. The pure devotee is not interested in what they can get from Krishna. They're interested in what they can give. And a pure devotee doesn't want to take from Krishna. You know, if you have a friend who's always giving you, at some point you don't want to take, you just want to give. No, no, I can't take, let me give. So that's the pure devotee. They don't, I've, Krishna, I've taken from you so many lives, I don't want to take anymore. I want to give. So I know for some of you this may sound weird. Isn't the, isn't the whole point to go back to God? It shouldn't I want to go back to God? This you know this world is is really insane, and um, that that is natural that we feel that way. But at a certain stage of your bhakti, you won't feel that way anymore because. You will be you will be with Krishna. When you chant, you'll be with Krishna. When you serve, you'll be with Krishna. You'll be with your spiritual master. So that desire to go back won't make any sense because you're already back. Even though you have a physical body, you're you are not in the material world. So and secondly, as I was saying, you won't want to ask anything because that would contaminate the relationship, right? You know the story with George Harrison? So George Harrison was very interested in meeting the devotees. He actually got a recording of Prabhupada chanting. And we were told he chanted for six hours with John Lennon on a crew, on a boat cruise. They chanted the whole time. And so he, he was looking for the devotees. He finally found them and said, I was looking for you. Um, everything that happened, it was John volunteering. Let's record, let's, re let's make an album. That was his idea. You need a bigger temple. That was his idea. The temple, Bhaktivedanta Manor, he, he bought that. That was his idea. So the devotees never, the devotees just helped him and they never asked for anything. And when you're a wealthy person, people are always asking you, and it really ruins the relationship. So Prabhupada needed about $20,000 to publish his Krishna book, the hardbound version. It was two volumes, I believe, as I remember, two volumes, and the books were quite large. The original Krishna books, I don't know if you've seen them, they're quite large. I don't have any. But take my word, yeah, they were big. Those were big books. They're, I don't think we have any books published by the BBT now, unless they're publishing Krishna books that are that big. And so Prabhupada told Shama Sundar, who was very close with George, Mukunda, Gurudas, and Shama Sundar. Maybe Shama Sundar was the closest. He was the first one that George met. And Prabhupada asked him, he said, please ask him to pay for the publishing of the book. And Shama Center didn't want to because he knew that so many people asked George for things and it would just ruin the relationship. Anyway, it's a long story. He did ask and George did pay. But a devotee is like that. He doesn't want to ask anything from Krishna. He just wants to give. And you can't artificially imitate it, but that's the goal, and that's the direction, and that's our prayer, and that's what we want to come to. In a, in a more immature state of bhakti, the desire to get out of this world 
can be very healthy for you because it's either I want to get out of this world or I want to enjoy it. Well, better get out of it. Better be adverse to it than try to enjoy it. So a lot of us join Krishna consciousness because we have become adverse, averse, isn't it? Averse to material enjoyment. Like we're frustrated. We're, we've, we've had bad experiences in the material world and say, I want to get out of this world. And you come to the temple and say, that's so nice here. I like it so much. Like that, right? So, so you might be confused because that, that idea is it's quite clear in, in our books that, you know, Prabhupada says you should want to get out of the material world. And now here he's saying that's a material desire. It's like confusing, right? It's not, it's not a material desire. It's just not what a pure devotee desires. That's the point. But you can't imitate that because if, if you imitate it, it's just artificial for you. I don't want anything. I just want to serve Krishna. Yeah. And then, you know, next week we find you um, very absorbed in some material activities. So it's better you're adverse than attracted. But aversion is not purity. When you're beyond attraction and aversion, you just want to please Krishna. Then then you have arrived, and, and you will arrive there, and it will come, but you can't artificially force it, but at least you know that's the goal. And yabhilashita shunyam. All other desires make them shunyam, zero. That's, that's bhaktir uttama, that's the highest bhakti. So now we can go back to the verse. Um, so we... I just wanted to make that clear for you. Hmm. Hmm. Those engaged in devotional service according to the ritualistic principles mentioned in the scriptures attain these different kinds of liberation. But although such devotees can attain sharshti, sarupya, samipya, and salokya, they are not concerned with these liberations. For such devotees are satisfied only in rendering transcendental, loving service to the Lord. The fifth kind of liberation, suyuja, is never accepted even by devotees who perform only ritualistic worship. Suyuja is becoming one. To attain suyuja or merging into the Brahman effulgence of the Supreme Personality of God is the aspiration of the impersonalist. A devotee never cares for suyuja. So for that's spiritual suicide for a devotee. So we go to text 19. Yuga dharma pavartanu namasin kirtan chari baba bhakti dhiya nachamu bhuvan. So this is Mahaprabhu speaking. I shall personally inaugurate the religion of the age, nam sankirtan, the congregational chanting of the holy name. I shall make the world dance in ecstasy, realizing the four mellows of loving devotional service. So this is Mahaprabhu stating his mission, stating what he will do. This is the Yuga Dharma chanting, and I will give ecstasy to the world, and I will spread Krishna consciousness, offering the four Chari Bhava Bhakti, the four moods, servitorship, friendship, parental, and conjugal. So, uh, sometimes it seems that Mahaprabhu was just coming to give conjugal love, and most of his associates and the intimate associates are in Madhurya Ras, that is their relationship, conjugal Ras. Here in this verse, he says he's coming to give all four. And that's true, he is. Um, Murari Gupta, you may know, was Hanuman in Ram Leela. He joined Mahaprabhu's pastimes. And Mahaprabhu joked with him and said, you should give up your relationship with Lord Ram. It's Kali Yuga, you know, now you get the mercy here. You know, you should worship Lord Krishna. And he couldn't do it because that's his relationship. So if you wake up one day and find out you're not in Madhurya Ras, but in your, you're in Sakya Ras, you're a friend of Krishna. Please don't have a nervous breakdown. 
you think, no, Mahaprabhu came to give Madhurya Ras, and I'm such a loser, I'm attracted to Sakya Ras. It's not exactly like that. He came to give all four. But he's shedding light on the gopi's relationship with Krishna because that's the highest exhibition of love. And that, that even if you're in Sakya Ras, that shedding, that focus on or hearing of the gopi's leela that nourishes your Sakya Ras also. Anyway, I'm sure most of you are not really worried about what your rasa is yet. Maybe some of you will stay up at night. Am I a coward boy? Am I a gopi? I can't sleep. It, it's, not, it's not like that because it, the natural inclinations come as you advance. So it won't, be, it won't be like that. And Prabhupada never said, well, after you've been a devotee six years, three months, two days and four hours, if you don't understand your relationship with Krishna, then you are you know, might as well just go back to mature life. He, he never explained it that way. He said that, that will come as we become purified. It will be revealed some way by one's guru, by the holy name, by the guru within. It will, you will come to know. But our main our main focus is that this is this is Krishna consciousness on one of these moods Mahaprabhu is giving. That's the main thing. So text twenty. Apayano Korimu Bhakta Bhava Angikore Apaniachari Bhakti Shikaimo Sabore. I shall accept the role of a devotee. And I shall teach devotional service by practicing it myself. So, you know, there's a difference. There's a difference if I tell you to do something and if I do it. It's easier for you if I teach it by doing it than if I just say this is how to do it. Sometimes when you learn something, someone will explain how to do it. And what will you say? Can you show me? I don't understand. Can you show me? Isn't it? So you'll find in other religions, uh, they talk a lot about love of God. And we say, okay, that's fine. Can you show me? Can you? And so Mahaprabhu said, okay, as Krishna, you misunderstood. I am with the gopis and you misunderstood. That is the highest love, but you couldn't understand it. So now I'll come as a sannyasi. This will be easier for you. You could understand this. I will show you devotion. I will show you what love is. And I will show you not only what it is, but I'll show you how to get it in a very simple way. So he comes as a devotee. It's, it's easier to teach us by example. And we can relate to Mahaprabhu because we're devotees. Can you relate to Krishna? Can you relate to Radha and Krishna? It's hard to relate to Radha and Krishna, isn't, isn't it? Because you'll always think, oh, well, just take Radha out and I'll go in, or just take Krishna out and I'll go in, but not in a spiritual way, in a material way. So Mahaprabhu comes as a sannyasi. As a devotee, we're also devotees, so we can relate to it, right? We're, we're doing the same thing, right? So don't you find Chaitanya Lila more relatable? It's like it, it only happened like, 500 plus years ago. You know, you go to Mayapur, it's probably pretty much, you go in the village, pretty much the same as it was 500 years ago. And there are devotees dressed pretty much how they dressed 500 years ago, singing the same songs pretty much they sang. It's very relatable. So I will continue reading. For those of you who haven't been to Mayapur, get on the next plane. Here's the purport. When one associates with a pure devotee, one becomes so elevated that he does not even aspire for Sharshti, Sarupya, Samipya, or Shalokya, because he feels such liberation is a kind of sense gratification 
Wow. Why would Prabhupada say that? We know in Bhaikuntha there's no sense gratification. Prabhupada's saying that, he said, because a pure devotee thinks, I want this for myself. And if I want it for myself, that is self-gratification. I should only want for Krishna. This one Christian said, you know, people think, well, how much money should I give to the church? How much should I keep? He said, he said, don't think that way. He said, think how much of God's money should I keep? And how much of God's money should I be giving? It's so that's how a pure devotee feels. It doesn't feel like um, it feels like anything, anything that I could give to Krishna that I'm holding back, then it's it's very personal. I want this. So as you advance in Krishna consciousness, this idea that I want, it, it lessens and lessens. It becomes more distasteful for you because it 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 interferes with pure bhakti, pure devotion. And one time Prabhupada was told a devotee wanted to chant 64 rounds a day, but it wasn't appropriate for him at that age and at time and place. So when they told Prabhupada that, Prabhupada said, oh, whenever you say I want, that is Maya. Like I want, of course they say, I want to serve Krishna. I want to uh, distribute books or whatever. That's different. But when you say I want, and it's something that your guru doesn't want, then you're in trouble. And then, then even though it's Krishna conscious, it's sense gratification. Yeah. You find that interesting? Sense gratification and Krishna conscious. Why is it sense gratification? Because I want to do it. I want it which is fine, we have so many things you can want to do. But if it's outside of devotional standards or it's against the will of your spiritual master, then it could be, not always, because you could discuss with your spiritual master, but it could be just, I want to do it because I want to do it. So a pure devotee, he's, he doesn't want to make demands on Krishna. And that's why when we asked Prabhupada, can we pray for you? Because he was sick. Prabhupada said, you, it's okay, but you have to pray and end the prayer with Krishna or begin the prayer with Krishna if you desire. Because I don't want my prayer to be fulfilled unless it's Krishna's desire. That's how a pure devotee naturally thinks. And the conditioned soul naturally thinks, what's in it for me? What am I going to get out of this? Why should I do this? How much are you paying? What favor are you going to do for me? Right? That's it. Material life and spiritual life in a nutshell. Okay. Text 21. Apane na kaila dharma shikana na jai. Aita Shiddhanta Gita Bhagavate Gai. Unless one practices devotional service himself, he cannot teach it to others. This conclusion is indeed confirmed throughout the Gita and Bhagavatam. Text 22. This is from Bhagavad Gita, as you may recognize. Yada yada hi dharmasya glanir bhavati bharata abhyutthanam adharmasya tadatmanam sijam yaham. Whenever and wherever there is a decline in religious practice, O descendant of Bharata, and a predominant rise of irreligion, at that time I descend myself. We're going now to the next verse in the Gita. Paritranaya sadhu nang dhinasaya chaduskritam dharma samstarpanathaya sambhavami yuge yuge to deliver the pious and to annihilate the miscreants, as well as reestablish the principles of religion, I myself appear millennium after millennium. Text 22 and 23 were spoken by Lord Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. Chapter 4, text 7 and 8. 
texts seven and eight. Texts 24 and 25, which follow, are also from Bhagavad Gita 324 and 321. Utsidheyor ime loka na koryam karma chid aham sankarasya chakartam sham upanyam ima prajaha. If I did not show the proper principles of religion, all these worlds would fall into ruin. I would be the cause of unwanted population and would spoil all these living beings. Text 25. Yad yad acharity shrishtas tadadive taro janaha sayat pramanam kurute lokas tad anuvartate. Whatever actions a great man performs, common people will follow. And whatever standards he sets by exemplary acts, all the world pursues. Text 26. So this text is interesting because it, it makes it a little more clear who Mahaprabhu is and why he's coming. Yuga dharma pravartana hoi angsahoite amabina onyadhare prajapremadite my plenary portions can establish the principles of religion for each age. No one but me, however, can bestow the kind of loving service performed by the residents of Braja. Okay, so this is important. Yeah, you remember a few weeks ago, we were having classes on Advaita Acharya. And we learned that Advaita Acharya is a combination of Mahavishnu and Sadashiva. And one would naturally think then, why was he, he's God himself, so why was he asking Mahaprabhu, why was he asked, praying that Krishna would come down and save the world? That one explanation was he didn't feel qualified for the world. It had become so bad now that he didn't feel he could do it. But here we're getting, we could say a deeper explanation, that Advaita Acharya could establish Dharma, but he couldn't give love. Only Krishna can do that. You could say Krishna is a god of love, Madan Mohan, the attractor of Cupid. And this verse shows how he is the attractor of love. And this specifically how he's the giver of love. He, only he can give love. The other forms cannot. And we were we were discussing uh, in the last class on Monday how when Krishna killed Putana, it wasn't Krishna, but it was Vishnu within Krishna who killed her. But it was Krishna who blessed her to become his mother. But that's what Krishna does. He does the blessing. Vishnu does the killing. So, so now Lord Krishna is thinking, okay, I want to give love. Why is he thinking he wants to give love? Because he is. That's all we need. To, that's the only reason we need to be worried about. He wants to give it. That's fine. He's going to give it. You don't need another reason. Because as devotees, we do not, do not question Krishna's will. Whatever is Krishna's will, we're happy with. That's what it means to be a devotee. Why does he do that? It doesn't seem right. No, we, we understand, even if we don't understand, everything he does is for the highest benefit and blessing of everybody, whether we understand it or not. So whatever Krishna does, he shows love, even when it doesn't look like love. That's what he does. And the, the Vishnu forms established dharma, religious principles. Yidahi dahi dharma sha glanir bhavati bharata. Krishna says, I come to establish religion. So he does that on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. But in Raj, he's not establishing religion. He's establishing love. The God of love. Surrounded by gods of love. Hare Krishna. Text 27. Shantvatara bhava 
Pankajana Basya Sarvato Bhadra, Krishna Danya Kova Latashvapi Premado Bhavati. There may be many all auspicious incarnations of the personality of Godhead, but who other than Lord Sri Krishna can bestow love of God upon the surrendered souls? This quotation from the writings of Bilva Mangala Thakur is found in the Lagu Bhagavatam Rita. Text 28. Tahate apana bhokta ganakori sanga pritivite avatari karimunanaranga. Therefore, in the company of my devotees, I shall appear on earth and perform various colorful pastimes. So I'm just going to chat. I think the chat may be empty, right? You are all stunned in ecstasy. Is that true? Oh, we have a question. Is this uh, Anurata? Is this a question from today's class or from? Yeah, for today's class. Okay. So we are officially start our question and answer session. And if there are not enough questions to occupy the next 20 minutes, we'll continue reading because you should all hear from Prabhupada's books about Mahaprabhu. I have a question. If a devotee commits a serious offense against the Prabhupada's mission, devotees, temple, scriptures, this kind, but still he has good appreciation for his guru, they have a good relationship and he does service to him, but he does not chant rounds and feels aversion to the holy name and other devotees. What would be his future about his bhakti life? Um, until he has good relationships with devotees, he'll remain on the Kanishta platform in his um, and we were talking about this, I think Monday or last Wednesday. We were talking about how. If we offend devotees, it's it's going to affect our chanting. And so there's an example. Uh, if someone is offending devotees, he's not chanting. That's that's often a symptom of offense. So the guru is always merciful. So he's getting mercy from his guru. Um, if he gets enough mercy and it serves his guru, the hope is that he will apologize, stop committing offenses, start chanting purely. And if he does that, then his future is good. If he remains as he is, then he'll have to come back and become purified and hopefully not commit offenses. We heard a story. I don't know if this story is going to scare you. But we heard a story that one devotee had offended Bhakti Siddhanta, and either Bhakti Siddhanta or someone or astrologer, I think it was Bhakti Siddhanta, told him. Um, In your last three lives, you were a fender to your guru. So I have some more bad news for you. But you can take the bad news and turn it around and make it good news. And this will help answer the question, Anurata. If one doesn't give up offenses, it's a good chance he'll come back uh, and commit more offenses because the tendency to commit offenses has to be purified. And if it's not purified, it will manifest again. So be careful, everybody. Um, this question is interesting because there's 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 not a whole lot of ways to get back to Godhead. You can't like sneak in. Well, I'll offend devotees, and, but I'll sneak in. There's a side door. They often leave it unlocked. And, you know, I'll sneak in at midnight when everybody's asleep. It's not like that. There is a, there is a process. And as we were talking in the last class, that offending devotees, that's like the door gets, that just locks the door for you. And it, it, it is very destructive to your sadhana. 
and it it shuts off the mercy valve when we offend Vaishnavas because it's through Vaishnavas that we get mercy. So it shuts off the mercy valve. And then without mercy, you're just, you're working on your own strength. So of course, if one's guru is merciful, at least the devotee is getting mercy from their guru. But if they're actually utilizing the mercy, then they would follow his instructions. So if they're not chanting their rounds and so forth, um, they're doing better, obviously, than if they weren't getting his mercy and, and he wasn't happy with them, but it's not complete. So, you know, those are signs, those are red flags. Right? Those are red flags. Not doing well in bhakti, it's a red flag. Something's going wrong somewhere. So generally, when a devotee is very devoted to his guru and very offensive to others, we say that's a little bit like a kanishta who is very devoted to the deity, but not respectful of devotees, doesn't know how to associate with devotees. They find it very similar. So his guru is like the deity. So it's better than nothing. It's better than being offensive to the guru and the devotees. But I would also say this, at least I could say personally, if I have a disciple who's offending devotees, and um, I take it personally as an offense to myself as well, because they're not doing what I ask them to do. They're, they're doing exactly the opposite. They're not doing what Prabhupada wants. So, you know, the guru can take it as an offense personally as well. So you say... I'm serving my guru, but I'm not following his instructions to respect devotees. So it's, it's better than nothing. That's, that's what I would say. It's better than nothing, but sometimes better than nothing is pretty bad. Right? Better than nothing, but that doesn't mean it's good. It just means it's something. So... Questions are pouring in from our millions of listeners around the world. Okay. One question left from the Holy Man class. Is that the last class or the one before that? Can one ever, this is from Emily, Emily Ramdas. Can one ever feel sad? Morose guilty for ending their job around. And what does that mean? Is there a chant and be happy? Or chant and miss Krishna, the activity of chanting? Um, are you saying this in a positive sense? Sad, remorse, guilt for ending their job around. So like saying, like, I'm sad, I have to go to work now. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, sadness and remorse and guilt can all be transcendental. If you feel sad, remorse, and guilty while you're chanting your rounds, that's not good. Well, remorseful is good, right? You know, the whole thing is, well, sad, remorse, and guilt are not good or bad. It just depends why. Yeah, you know, I would have liked to chant it longer, but I had to give this class. I don't know, I'm so depressed right now. Can you tell how depressed I am? I'd actually, today, I'd actually rather be reading. I'd I got interrupted while I was studying for like 45 minutes and I was like, oh, I, I want to go back and study some more. But now it's time to give class. I'm so depressed. No, not like that. I'm depressed that I can't keep giving class for the next 10 hours. That's, that's better. Chan and Miss Krishna. Yeah, that's good. Rasika. How do you interact with people who are always looking for reasons to be offended without offending them? Oh, that's easy. Just, just keep a cow's distance from them, six feet. Just follow the COVID protocol, you'll be fine. And um, keep your ears plugged up with earplugs just so you can't hear them, then you'll be fine. Um, I guess the question is, 
you can't do that. I guess I implied in the question is I can't do that because they're never, uh, I can't avoid them. If you can avoid them, that's number one. That's our instruction is not to hear offenses. Um, and if people are always looking to be offended, they get out of bed, another great day. I'm going to look who can offend me today. I'm looking. You know. What does Rasika mean by that? She means that there are people who are actually, they're not, they don't go around like Sherlock Holmes looking to be offended, but pretty much they do, you know, indirectly they do. You know, like, hey, do you, you see this on Facebook? I can't believe it. The GBC, what they said. Oh my God, where's our movement going? They're look, you know, it's like everything offends them. It's like, you know, if they don't get offended by it, they think they're not doing their duty or something. So you have to make a decision, Rasiko, who are your friends and who you will respect at a cow's distance or more than a cow's distance. And if you want to respect from a distance to protect your creeper, that's not offensive. If you have to work with them, that's another question. Um, if they're looking to be offended, just ask them, say, what might I do that would offend you because I don't want to? And I just, you know, want to make sure I don't do anything to offend you. Can you tell me what that might be? Of course, that might offend them if you ask them. That's infinite loop, right? Infinite regress. No, no, and they get angry. You're like, no, 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 I didn't mean that. Oh, now you're lying to me. I know you meant it. You know, so it's like, as the saying goes, with friends like that, who needs enemies? There's this funny little skit. This man is going to the gym. He tells his wife, and he's like, so you're going to the gym, you didn't invite, invite me. He said, but I did yesterday. And you said, you don't go, that was yesterday. Why didn't you ask me today? You, know, you don't like me, right? No, no, I didn't say that. Now you're lying. You know, it's just like, it just goes, to, you can't win. You know? The Brahmacharya's nightmare. You can do a little skit. Brahmacharya's nightmare. Can you please give some examples of typical offenses towards devotees? Well, Bhaktivinoda Thakur lists categories of offenses. You know, you're criticizing them for their caste, their birth. Oh yeah, those are Americans. You know. Everybody knows that Americans are this. Oh, those are Indians. Oh, those are low class, low caste Indians. That's why they're making all the trouble. That's why the temple's going nowhere. Yeah. Oh, he used to be a this, or he never graduated university. That's why he's like this, you know. So that's one kind of offense. Um, Another kind of offense Bhakti Thakur says is sins. Yeah, you know what he used to do? He's a drug addict before he's a devotee. You know, right? Look, I mean, you can just tell by looking at him, right? It's still got that nature. Oh, he was a thief. He was married six times. You know, past activities, not even sinful, just past activities that aren't devotion, finding fault. Um, I think the worst is when you, an example Prabhupada gives is that. Um, You deny something good that the person does. No, no, he, they're just making, it's just propaganda. He could never do that. And then take it one step worse. You make up something that he didn't do. You hear a rumor. I knew it. I knew it. You know, what's the rumor? He just killed 20 people. I knew it. I never trusted him. Like, you, you really believe he did that? Uh, so, yeah, things of that nature. And, and general... I hate that devotee. I can't stand that devotee. That devotee is such a blank, blank. You know, those are pretty gross offenses. They're not indicative of the mentality of a devotee. So maybe maybe a, a, an umbrella answer to this question, Achutananda Das, is anything which reflects a mentality of someone who's not trying to be a pure devotee is offensive. It's an offensive mentality. Like, would a pure devotee say that? Would a pure devotee do that? 
right? That kind of makes it easy for you to figure out. Making assumptions about people, making value judgments about them. Oh, that so and so, he's like this. How do you know? Well, because he's the disciple of so and so, and they're all like that. They're all fanatics. You know? Do you have you ever talked to him? No, I can, but I can tell. You know, this kind of mentality. Yeah. So, so. Where is the where is the mentality behind the der, general derision? That's what is the mentality, not where it is. What is it? That general mentality is the cause of the offenses, and anything done with that mentality becomes offensive. The other way to answer the question is just meditate on what it means to be humble and respectful. Get a clear idea what that is, and everything that isn't humble and respectful is probably to one degree or another at best neutral but one degree or another usually offensive to some point on the scale of one to ten hmm. wow my office is starting to look like a spider zoo but they make their homes here, you know. I don't want to disrupt their homes. I feel bad. You know, we're all we're all so depressed by seeing what's going on in Ukraine. But these spiders just spent a long time building their homes. I don't like to disrupt them. Anyway, as long as they don't bite me, I'll let them stay. I won't be alone in my office. Contemptuous ridicule or mockery. Yeah. Did you hear about so and so? He just he opened a new project and he's it's like hundreds of people are coming. Yeah, probably all stupid people that don't understand how bad he is. Are we? Yeah. Well, well, that's it. You know, the city in India, they're all devotees anyway. So it's not like he made them devotees, they're all devotees. They're just He's just giving them prasadam, so they're all coming. You know, anybody could do that. You know, that kind of mentality. Another oh, a decision was made by our temple president. Another stupid decision. All they do is make stupid decisions. You know, that is not. My point is, what is the mentality of a devotee? That is not the mentality of a devotee. And so, just check in your mentality. Is this how a devotee thinks and behaves? Because, because if it's not. It's offensive. It's even you can be offensive to people. It's not just devotees. It's a mentality. So you'll be offensive to people. You'll be offensive to devotees. You'll be offensive to devotee. You'll be offensive to everybody. Also, it's a mentality. You can read about it in the chapter "Divine and Demoniac Natures" in Bhagavad Gita. It's kind of like you know how many people can you knock down today? That's your pleasure, you know. Knock. So, you know, you don't kill them, you just kill them with your words. And you're like, well, today was a good day. You know, I, I knocked down to like 50 devotees, you know, for their nonsense. Yeah, that's not good. How do you... Okay. Anything else? You have four minutes to say something. Otherwise, we can officially end and utilize the next three minutes for sleeping. As Prabhupada would once joke, whenever you have free time, you utilize it well for sleeping. You, you realize what Prabhupada had to deal with? He had to deal with us. You know, it's like, you know. Can you imagine that austerity, right? They're like, hey, Rasika, you're having trouble dealing with devotees. Imagine Prabhupada. He's the guru. He's a pure Vaishnava from Braj, comes to New York. He's got to deal with people. Don't even clean their plates after they eat, and he has to wash them. 
Hare Krishna. So. Could we generalize and say that seeing devotees in a material way and lacking respect towards them is offensive? Yeah. That's the beginning of the seed of offenses. Chudananda giving us a quote from Jaivadana. We consider that it is essential to arouse bhava toward Bhagavan, love for God, by any means possible. The door leading to gradual elevation is firmly shut if people on any level of worship are ridiculed or condemned. Those who fall under the spell of dogmatism and therefore become sectarian lack the qualities of generosity and munificence. That is why they ridicule, condemn others who do not worship in the same way as they do. This is a great mistake on their part. So he's talking about people of other religions. Yeah, that shows an interesting mentality, right? How can we surrender ourselves to Lord Krishna? Chant Hare Krishna without offense. Anyway, how can we not surrender to Lord Krishna? You got somebody better to surrender to? What are you gonna what do you want to surrender to? Ice cream and cake? Materialism? Surrender to the man, the system, surrender to Maya, surrender to the demigods. Who you got somebody better to surrender? You know that verse, Kavita, you know the verse in um, Bhagavatam and said, you know, describes Krishna. Krishna gave Putana a position as a mother. And so the verse says, who, how could I surrender to anyone else? Like, who, who do you approach? And you try to kill them, and they bless you. Like, so like, who else are you going to surrender to? There isn't anybody. Of course, there's our own mind, but that doesn't work. How's that working for you? Surrendering to your mind and senses. How's that been going for the last 10 zillion lifetimes? Not so well, right? Probably... You know, surrendering to Krishna might go better. What do you think? <laughs> so when you understand that, it's it's no more surrender. It's just, yes, yeah, what I want to do. It's the only thing that makes sense. Hare Krishna. <laughs> oh, to put it bluntly, don't be stupid and surrender to anybody other than Krishna. That's kind of what I'm saying. How do I surrender to Krishna? Tune up your brain, get an oil and lube, screw all the screws in tight, and yeah, you'll just naturally surrender to Krishna because it's the only thing that makes sense. Right? Why would I surrender to someone else? You know, what, what's the payment? Another body, more suffering. Krishna says, surrender to me. I'll, you can live with me eternally in loving relationship. Uh, let me think about it. I got, you know, other other options. Let me think about my other options before I come back to you. Like, that's stupid. What are your other, you got any good options? I don't think so. Hare Krishna. All right, Gormani, we are just like waiting for you to fire the button. Oh, we're already on, are we?